This is the David Webb Show. Joining me now, Dr. William Parker, the author of Guaranteeing America's Security in the 21st Century. And he also served several years in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, including time at the embassy in Kabul. Uh, Bill, good morning to you. Good morning. Not a good morning in Afghanistan, or in the this case, later in the day. But, Bill, what we've seen play out, uh, just your view of what we're seeing on the news and what we're not sure. seeing. Sure, David. You know, um, first of all, the U.S. military and our allies, and for that matter, a lot of the Afghan military uh, fought well, fought intelligently throughout the last 20 years there. Uh, so it's inaccurate to show a lack of leadership uh, on their part. However... You had 2,300 plus troops lost, U.S. troops lost, 300,000 trained Afghan troops and tons of modern weaponry and ammunition captured by the Taliban. We spent almost a trillion dollars. We watched the U.S. flag come down at one of our most expensive and hard fought uh, for embassies while America's sons and daughters are asked to go back into Afghanistan and resecure areas they have fought for before. And that's just insane. You know, in my opinion, when there's a crisis, leaders stand up and cowards cower, and they look for excuses. President Ghani, President Biden, Vice President Harris, Speaker of the House Pelosi, and SecDef Austin were nowhere to be found during the fall of Afghanistan. Ghani ran out from uh, and away from Afghanistan, while Biden went to Camp David without his national security team. Harris went to California again to spend time at her home. SecDef was missing in action, and Jen Psaki left a message on her phone that she was taking time off. The only one who tried to address the public as this went down was the sacrificial lamb, Tony Blinken. Now, someone recently told me that Biden was not well. Imagine the next leadership team if Biden is sick, and I pray he's not. You'd have President Harris, Vice President Pelosi, and SecDef Lloyd Austin running the team. I'm concerned. Where do those concerns lie in the context of Pakistan? Where do your concerns rather lie, Bill, in the context of Pakistan, the surrounding nations? You've got Iran on one border. You've got former Soviet bloc countries like Turkmenistan. Uh, You've got the ability now of the Taliban to work with allies in other regions, whether they carry the name or not, they carry the ideology. Um. You know, I think it was a huge black eye uh, for the United States and for NATO, uh, quite frankly, and our ISAF uh, allies uh, as this happened. I think you will see a rebuilding of uh, some kind of uh, caliphate effort here over the coming uh, years. Um, I think that um, it's likely that you're going to see some kind of attempted attacks uh, on the free world here in the coming uh, weeks or months. I would not be surprised at all if that comes sooner. Um, I think that um, uh, the relationship uh, between Pakistan and the Taliban is something we need to look at uh, hard and and Al Qaeda. Uh, We need to look at that hard. And remember, Pakistan is a uh, is a nuclear nation um, and we've had issues before uh, there. I think we need to look at the relationship with China inside um, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, they're obviously going after the uh, the minerals, so this will be a financial windfall uh, for China. And remember, many of the minerals that are needed for the new electric cars um, can be found in Afghanistan. So um, the reality is, for battery efforts, et cetera, it's a great place to own real estate if you can uh, get at the resources. And I think that's one of the things you'll see China going after. Yeah, I mean, in the last several years, there have been moments when I, I have questioned some of the actions taken, not only by this country, but in allowing China to have such input in the Obama Biden years. China was out, was allowed to come in and take control of uh, rare earth mineral resources, large deposits in Afghanistan. At times, and I remember this video as clearly as if it was yesterday. Uh, there was a scene of Geraldo Rivera standing in an area where our Marines had driven out Taliban fighters. There were poppy fields there, and we were turning them over 
to the very enemy, the Taliban. I, I just those examples always made me wonder why are we making such decisions? Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, one of the one of the concerns uh, that that you have to have as a as a nation when you look at national security perspectives is our understanding of what is going on in other parts of the world. As an example, the debathification of Iraq was a complete blunder on our part. Had we not debathified, and I'm not saying there weren't some in the Ba'ath Party that were bad, but had we not debathified, then the Iraqi people would have been able to maintain their country, much like uh, MacArthur did uh, when he went into Japan at the end of World War II. He didn't remove all the leadership and all the intellects. Instead, he kept them in place. And therefore, it was a, a much smoother transition. And quite frankly, the people uh, of Japan suffered much less because they were allowed to continue to work, et cetera. So debathification is just one of many examples where we did not understand the environment we were going into. So I think in the future, if we're going to go into an environment for any reason, um, a, a, a rock or an Afghanistan kind of issue, and I think it'll be a very long time before we do this again, um, I think we need to truly understand what's going on, which means that you not only are talking to military leadership and politicians and others, but you need to talk to historians. You need to talk to social scientists and people who have spent many years on the ground in that environment. Now, that was that was attempted. You know, the Dave Petraeus of the world, the Jim Stavridis of the world, they tried to bring in people to uh, better educate but at the end of the day, the politicians who are making these very significant decisions must also be informed before they can make decisions to do things like debathification. Is part of the problem, and I, I know there's probably an easy answer for many out there listening, but is part of this problem that politicians don't often make the right military decision. We have civilian leadership in this country. But unfortunately, politics at times leads where military reality should be the first part. I, I, I make no bones about it uh, for myself and speaking for myself that if you go into defeat an enemy, there will be death. There will be collateral damage. But the deaths of many, if the wrong side wins, as we see this play out in Afghanistan, will far outweigh those that would have died in a concerted effort to destroy the Taliban? Well, first of all, I, I am a, a complete believer that um, we should be a civilian led. Uh, we should have a civilian led military and that we should have a civilian led uh, government. There's no doubt about that. And I know that's not the point you're getting at, but I just want to just clarify that, that it should be civilian led. That said, it should be civilians who are well-educated and well-informed. Uh, and part of that means that you put around you uh, people who are well-educated and well-informed, and, and that's the important part. You need to make sure that your National Security Council, for example, is, uh, are, are people who are true experts in the field. Uh, we have to get out of this idea that every time you have a change of presidents, that we get rid of the entire National Security Council and bring in a whole new team. That's just a bad idea across the board because you have so much uh, uh, information that people learn over a two, three, four, eight-year period um, that is lost as soon as that whole team is, is kicked out. Uh, additionally, the idea of removing all of your ambassadors and replacing them with other ambassadors um, when you have a change of presidents also not the greatest of ideas. Now, I realize that may be a little politically naive, but the reality is that if you kept some of those ambassadors in there and you kept more of your senior leadership team in place across the government, we would have less of this loss of intellectual uh, information, if you will, and maybe we'd have less of these blunders in the future. All right, going broader on this bill, and as I said to my prior guest, uh, John Michelle, who you know, and others, we're going to be analyzing this, so stay by your phone. You wrote, arguably, and in my opinion, one of the best books anyone can read, Guaranteed America's Security in the 21st Century. Now let's talk about America's security, not just home, but abroad, because from a security perspective, an emboldened enemy will expand and act. What do you say to that? 
Well, uh, first of all, that book, Guaranteeing America's Security in the 21st Century, while I had the lead on writing that, there were other really smart people like the Supreme Allied Commander, former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, uh, Admiral Stavridis, uh, wrote the foreword for that. Uh, the former Undersecretary of the Navy uh, uh, wrote, a, wrote a section of that and some very smart officers across the intelligence world and across um, the services um, played a major part in writing that book. So, uh, you know, Janine Davison and others played a major part in that. That said, um, where I think that we need to look very carefully right now is our um, internal security, because uh, I think they're coming. And, um, and, And I think we need to start that by securing our borders really securing our borders uh, and, and not letting just anyone come across the border. Um, uh, that wall, uh, quite frankly, has to be built. That wall is not to keep out people that are, are good immigrants, that they, they want to come into this country. And they know most of us are sons or grandsons of immigrants, um, and we encourage that. But there's a right way to do this process, and we cannot feed everyone. More importantly right now, if you don't get the borders secured, and that includes our oceanic borders, uh, we are going to have a major evolution that could be much worse than what we had in uh, on 9/11. And I will also tell you that, you know, COVID, COVID basically took the United States and the globe to its knees. And to have people coming into this country that aren't vaccinated, that we don't even have any idea what kind of disease they have, that doesn't make them bad people. But we need to know what disease is coming into this country and what people are carrying, whether it's illicit drugs or some kind of uh, weapon of mass destruction. Um, I think that's our biggest concern for the near future. And if this administration doesn't go after that like yesterday, um, I think we're going to uh, reap what we sow. Your point's well taken that a weakened nation... Uh, one that is inconsistent in its policy is even more of a target for our enemies around the world. Uh, outside of the domestic issues you just described, uh, and while our bases are fairly well guarded, I think it's a good way to say it, or very well guarded around the world, some are in more tenuous areas, more dangerous areas. Uh, what should their security uh, look like now? What should their uh, force con level B. Yeah, I, I won't get into in, into details uh, on on what additional efforts I think should be taken um, at each one of these bases or forward operating bases, et cetera, around the globe. Um, but I will say that they should be um, beefing them up. I, I think I'll, I'll stop there with that. But there are certain specific um, efforts that should be taken immediately um, in, in order to increase our uh, capability to defend against those kind of attacks. Thank you, Bill. Stay by your phone. Unfortunately, we will be having a lot more of these conversation in the coming days and weeks, my friend. Thank you. All right, David. Thank you very much. Dr. Bill Parker, again, he'll also be uh, back on to help us analyze. This is a developing situation. Uh, that will play out not just in days, weeks, but in months. And we will follow this very closely. Uh, I'll be not shocked to see more terrible news coming out. The visual, the communication today, the fact that the Taliban will use this to their benefit even on social media.